tuned in to the Andrew Lawton Show. Let's, for example, take a look at this video footage from the weekend at a popular Toronto restaurant at which I've never been, but I've heard very good things about Cafe Landver. Now, you may wonder why they're targeting this restaurant. Now, I've never been there. Supposedly, they have very good schnitzel. To my knowledge, the restaurant has never been explicitly political. I have not seen any statements or proclamations of being Zionist, but the restaurant is Jewish-owned. And it seems to me, from my perspective, the only reason it was targeted by these activists is because a Jew dared own a restaurant in downtown Toronto, and that is worthy of calls for boycott. You often hear university campuses very explicitly and openly vow to support the boycott divestment sanctions movement, which is to say we should boycott Israeli products. Sometimes they will go so far as to say Israeli people, Israeli academics, and divest from any Israeli company and sanction Israeli products and all of that. And it's not actually Israel thereafter, it's Jews. And they can cloak it all they want in the pretend, oh, I'm just an anti-Zionist or, oh, I'm just making criticisms of Israel. But a lot of these people hate the Jewish people and are very proud of that fact. Now, I've always said, despite my criticisms of this, I am a supporter of freedom of speech. I believe you have the right to express very heinous views. I take a very broad view of free speech. Uh, I will also say that some of the rhetoric we've seen in some of these protests in the last couple of weeks very much crosses that threshold of threatening violence or supporting terrorism, which is where we get into trickier territory. Now, that being said, as with that letter signed by the uh, Ryerson, or no, you can't say Ryerson anymore, the TMU law students, uh, it's probably more useful to know who these people are, which you don't get if you go the censorship route. But I saw an interesting tweet from Ari Goldkind, who's a, a lawyer in, uh, you may know, he's quite a superstar on the media circuit, and I've had the great privilege of being on his show on a couple of occasions. But Ari Goldkind uh, shared that video from the protests outside Lanver, and he said, I'm a supporter of the police, which in my line of work isn't popular, but I don't think I've ever felt more let down by the police than in the last two weeks, turning a complete blind eye, which they'd never do with a proud boy, a non-social distancer, or God forbid, a trucker. Ari Goldkind joins me now. Ari, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Great to be with you, Andrew. So let's first off, let, let, let me get your take on that law letter, uh, because here we have students that are in a couple of weeks going to be doing interviews with, you know, some of these big Bay Street law firms. And, and I know we can talk about how institutions have gone so woke, but I can't imagine there are a lot of law firms in Toronto that would want anything to do with people saying that this call to violence should be welcomed. Well, Andrew, as much as I tend to agree with a lot of the things you say, I'm going to disagree on that one. They will be hired within a nanosecond. Uh, this, this is how Toronto now works. All one has to do is look at demographics in Toronto to understand the imbalance here between people with my last name and people who think people with my last name should be wiped off the face of the earth. The fact that this is now going to be the future lawyers of this country, forget even the anti-Jew part of it. And no, I don't accept that the anti-Israel part means that they're not anti-Jew. It's just a, a euphemism that they use as a get out of jail free card. But leaving aside the anti-Jewish hate, because I don't actually love the word anti-Semitic, it's not specific enough. These are also people that are going to be in charge of free speech, free expression, which we know will not only be free, it'll be expensive, but it could cost you your life, your business, your boycott. And the worst part about it, Andrew, is that nobody's doing a thing about it because the political people that could do something about it or the people at the top of the corporate food chain, which often have more power than even politicians, they understand the demographics in this country. The members of parliament understand the writings 
And you don't need votes of people with last names of Goldkind or Schwartz or Silverstein to get elected anymore. They know the demographics, they know the birth rates, they know our country's completely open border. So when you hear Trudeau and his sycophants saying, we don't like anti-Semitism, but on the same day they welcome hundreds if not thousands on a daily basis mm -hmm. of anti-Semites to this country, all you're now seeing at Cafe Landwehr and other places is people who thought they needed to be a little bit quieter, now they're emboldened, they're doing it in a blazing way. And the part that concerns me, given the double standards of the last few years, Andrew, is that they know they can do it, they're untouchable. And this country that I thought would be safe for people with my last name is now clearly, clearly becoming unsafe. And for those who say, oh, Ari, you're clutching your pearls, which you're not actually wearing, I can tell you that in the late 1920s and early 1930s, there was no greater place on the earth for Jews to live than Germany and Poland. It's a heart-wrenching tale you tell, and one I hear from so many of my Jewish friends. Uh, just over the weekend, there was the president of a Detroit synagogue who was stabbed in her home. I mean, this is, I fear, a story that's going to be repeating itself elsewhere. Cafe, Cafe Land, where it's only crime, insofar as I've been able to uh, see it, is that they happen to be Jewish in Toronto right now, which is enough to attract this attention. And you are right when you make that reference in your tweet to truckers. When there were a group of people that were planning when the convoy was in Ottawa to drive around Toronto and honk their horns for a bit, police were giving press conferences. They were talking about all these preventative measures. And even if they didn't charge, they were saying, we need to be out in full force to say we aren't going to stand for this. Where is that on this scourge of anti-Semitism? It's non-existent. So, so let me bring in a little bit of the law here. I mean, I'm not dressed like this to see you, Andrew. I am in the middle of my workday and always a delight. To I thought people. I was special. Well, you are. But here's where I'm going to go back to agreeing with something that you said at the beginning. You and I are both almost free speech absolutists, okay? And I very much am a free speech absolutist. Here's the point. You now have a country that says there are hate speech laws, that says public incitement to hatred is unacceptable. But it seems like there's only one group of people that you can do it with, only one group of people. And where I say is, if police were not going around and arresting people for not socially distancing, or for demonstrating in Ottawa, or for saying they don't want a vaccine mandate, or not standing six feet behind somebody at Costco or Walmart, I would be the first to say, look, police really shouldn't get in here. This is odious and disgusting. But by what double standard can somebody be arrested? I mean, literally arrested for taking their kid rollerblading in COVID or complaining about Pfizer but these people publicly inciting hatred and genocide, which is what they're doing of the Jewish people means no police response should be forthcoming. And Andrew, to go inside baseball, I can tell you very specifically, a friend of mine was assaulted at Young and Bloor the other night, right on video, right at one of these massive demonstrations. And the police made very clear to him as a Jew, they're not there to arrest. They don't wanna make things any more heated they're just there to observe. This is a Toronto police service, which I've lost a lot of love in my business. I'm a criminal defense lawyer that's supposed to be very anti-police and not liking police. I'm very out, outspokenly pro-police. The fact that the police brass, I don't put this on the beat cop, Andrew. The fact that the police brass understand the new demographics of the greater Toronto area, and it certainly isn't Jewy, and the fact that they're allowing this to take place is a very, very scary thing. And if you take the view that they should be hands off, which is a legitimate, mm -hmm. debatable view, it's a very worthy debate, then ask yourself, should dad have been arrested for taking kid rollerblading two years ago? And trust me, I did those cases. So if the police are concerned with Tamara Leach, on a day, by the way, where her stupid bail charge was just withdrawn a half yes. an hour before you and I spoke. 
She did 49 or 59 nights in jail. The charge was withdrawn. These people are advocating on Young Street in Toronto that people like me should be killed and put into the sea. That's what they're saying. If you don't believe me, hire a translator. And the fact that they're all going to be future lawyers, and this is what Ryerson or, or TMU students are putting in, lawyers occupy, as much as I can make 100 jokes, Andrew, a pretty lofty place at certain levels mm -hmm. in our culture. The idea that not only they're signing this and thinking it, but they're saying it proudly, other, un unlike those cowardly Harvard pieces of garbage who didn't have the guts to sign it. These people are putting their names to it, and it won't cost them a single thing. Well, and therein lies, I, I think, the crucial part of this, Ari, which is that there has been in the last couple of weeks, and I, I'd say it's been increasing over a number of years, the normalization of this. I mean, it used to be uh, people had the wherewithal to conceal certain beliefs like this, and maybe you'd see these pockets on university campuses. But now when someone says from the river to the sea, which is, you know, calling, I did the whole map analysis last week on this show. It's, it, they're, they're, it's they're from the river to the sea is the entirety of Israel. It's property, Andrew. People have more property in Alberta. Yeah, exactly. So when they say that, it's, uh, you know, I think an incredibly important point that they're proud of that. You know, they're proud of saying all forms of resistance. Now, you have to have a level of temerity and brazenness to defend unequivocally all forms of resistance when babies were beheaded. Like, how on earth did this become so acceptable? Oh, I believe we've lost Ari there. Uh, we uh, will hopefully get him back in a couple of moments. But I, I think the point stands. When, when they say all forms of resistance, they are saying that any single news story we have heard of atrocities happening was in their minds completely A-OK. -okay. That's the position they've taken. Yesterday, I don't know if you saw this, and I I haven't done it myself because I was uh, traveling yesterday, and to be honest, I don't know if I want to. But Israel, the Israeli government released to journalists hours and hours of footage and information it collected from Hamas officials and uh, operatives that were apparently wearing body cams. Like they, they shared this, and they said to all these people, you don't believe what they were doing here. Here's the evidence of what they were doing. And you're still going to get deniers and all of that. But uh, we've got Ari back. Ari, I don't know where we lost you there. But basically, my, my question was, w when you say all forms of resistance are fine, knowing what we know about what Hamas has done, you're defending that. And how did that become acceptable? How did that become a position that you could, in mainstream society, express? Well, look, you start, Andrew, and I think somebody's not liking what I'm saying, so they cut the internet feed, even though it looks four bars. But in any event, you look at 9-11, okay? The first, and I think all roads, I always believe this, Andrew, I'm a person fascinated by 9-11. I'm 49 years old. It's imprinted in my DNA. I have walked the tracks at Auschwitz. When you walk the tracks at Auschwitz, you feel things differently than an 18-year-old who never saw 9-11, and who has no idea what the Holocaust is. What they're saying right now, remember after 9-11, the first thing Bush said is, don't be mad at the philosophy or political religious ideology that did this to America. It wasn't just done to the buildings, it was done to America. That's the first thing Bush did. So what did every Western world country do, Andrew? They did the opposite of what they should do. Now let's bring this back home to Canada. Look at that bill, whether it's M13 or I can't remember what it is, I don't remember. You're not allowed to say anything about the fastest growing religion in Canada. You're not allowed to say anything. If you're saying anything about it, you're told that you're phobic or that you have a certain phobia. But they can say anything they want about Jews, including from the river to the sea, and they're more specific than that. They call for actual murder, mm -hmm. genocide, and death. Nobody says a word about it. And here's the kicker. If somebody like me says what I'm saying, and Justin Trudeau hears me today, he'll come out and say, I'm making this up, but it's exactly what he'd say. Well, I've heard Ari Goldkind, and anti-Semitism has no place in our country. And Islamophobia is one of the most serious problems in our country. They can never, ever understand or say out loud, where does the new anti-Semitism come from? Does it come from a proud boy? Does it come from MAGA? 
Does it come from the Ku Klux Klan? This is not a difficult puzzle to solve. It's not getting the caramel in the Cadbury bar. That's what is so pernicious mm -hmm. and sinister about this, is that you can never talk about this issue with one of these actually grotesque liberal MPPs or the entire disgusting NDP always conflating anti-Semitism and Islamophobia when they're not to be conflated. And when the numbers and the birth rates in this country suggest that if you're Jewish, Houston, we have a problem. If you're not, you're in control of everything. And now they're in control of more than you're even allowed to talk about, which used to be, by the way, the pernicious stereotypical Jewish myth mm -hmm. that Jews were kind of proud of, but we were wanting to make art develop vaccines, uh, do heart surgery, write piano concertos, uh, advance the law in a good way for the underprivileged. Now, where are things from the group that is growing exponentially? It is to push people like me into the sea. And people keep saying, Andrew, and people who don't have my last name can't understand this. Oh, it'll never get to 1929, 1933, what do you think the next step is when they go to the Jewish businesses? Do you think it's to peacefully protest? They're emboldened and they're emblazoned. This country is in trouble and we have been completely, completely abandoned by a federal government that, by the way, Andrew, is obsessed with minority rights so long as that minority is the majority of their voters. Think that through. Just one final question, because you mentioned M103, which was the anti-Islamophobia motion. And, uh, you know, I was very critical of that uh, going back, and I, people can read what I, I wrote at the time. But a lot of the Jewish groups, and by that I mean, you know, the official Jewish groups that proclaim to speak for Jewish people, and I don't yeah, always, exactly. but I, I think... Pro proclaim, don't get me started yeah, on Yeah, proclaim. Yeah, yeah. Were, were standing in lockstep with a lot of the Muslim groups when M103 was coming up. And I think a lot of them felt they had to, that, you know, they, they would be hypocritical to talk about anti-Semitism without condemning Islamophobia. But a lot of them had had egg on their face the last two weeks. I mean, they've been wondering when that reciprocation is going to come, and it just hasn't. It, it's been, some of the Muslim groups have get gave very cursory condemnations. Many didn't even do that. And most of them have actually come out with outright endorsements of uh, what Hamas has done in the week since. And I think a lot of uh, very well-meaning Jewish people kind of got hoodwinked during that Islamophobia discussion. All right, so I understand the last part. I'm actually not sure they're well-meaning. I think they've committed suicide. I think they've killed themselves. I think they've killed others. This was always suicidal to me. You could see the writing on the wall 10 million miles away, all you have to do is study demographics, study what's happened in the West, study what's happened in Europe, study what's happened in Canada, and you can understand, even this rabbi that was killed that they say, well, they have no evidence it's a hate crime in Detroit. Well, what was it, a love crime? Even that rabbi was instrumental in saying that the other side are her friends. And if we've ever seen a wake up call where people shot at raves in the Negev desert, innocent, truly innocent people beheaded, whatever you want to say, carved up, elderly, younger. If there was ever a line in the sand that if the two religions were going to come together, as the religion of peace says, it's a religion of peace and we're going to come together. If there was ever an example where people would say there's just a bridge too far, you would think shooting people driving down a road or at a music rave of all races and religions, Americans, Brazilians, uh, Asians, whatever it is, you would think they'd come out and say, you know what? We have to do something about it. I mean, their side. Instead, it's all this nonsensical, woke garbage language, settler colonialism, this, that, and the other. It's all horse manure. It's garbage. And as far as I'm concerned, the Jews that have gone down this road, who tend to be left or far left, have all essentially assisted the rest of us in committing suicide because they all didn't listen to the words from 1945, which was never again. And all they've done is allow it to begin again. Ari Goldkind, always a pleasure. I know it's been very difficult for, for you in the last few days, but I, I'm glad you're speaking out the way you are, sir. Thank you for coming on. Always good to talk to you, Andrew. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. 
Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.